Hey, what's up you guys? Marty Schwartz here with Marty Music. Really excited to be doing another episode of Guitar Tours. I'm in Chattanooga, Tennessee at Songbirds Guitar Museum. Pretty much heaven on earth for a guitar enthusiast. I walked in and it was like, I've never seen anything like it. You're about to experience it with me. And we have an expert here who curates the museum, David Davidson. Hey, how are you? Man, thanks so much you. for welcoming us here. You know, letting Thank us- Thank you for being here. Yeah, I, I mean, there's just, it's like overwhelming the amount of guitars to talk about. <laughs> and I know you're the guy to talk to. It's uh, been overwhelming for me. It's It's been a really long run of collecting and it's been a lot of fun. How long have you guys been open here? Well, we've been open here about 17 months, but the story goes back way before that. Yeah, you've already had tons of living legends already come through here, right? Yeah, we've been fortunate. I mean, before we even opened, we had Joe Bonamassa come in and when we were just really stocking the shelves, so to speak, <laughs> and he just he just couldn't believe it. We stay in contact often about, you know, his new finds, my new finds, and, right. and, and we enjoy it. This particular episode, we're gonna be talking about Fenders, I believe. Yeah, and since sounds like a good way to start. Yeah, not bad, right? In fact, it was almost crazy. I'm realizing that this is one of the many like one of a one of a kind guitars, right? Yeah, really what you're holding is the very first sunburst Fender guitar. The story on this goes, a gentleman named Verlin Whitford went down to uh, Fender in Fullerton, California in uh, early 1951 to purchase a broadcaster guitar. And uh, Fender at that point was already kind of phasing out the broadcaster guitar. It was gonna be the what became the Nocaster and then the Telecaster. Right. He came in and he bought a beautiful blonde Esquire. And w the reason why he wound up with an Esquire is because they didn't have any more decals. So they just basically retrofitted the guitar with a second pickup. And we have that guitar in the back. And while he was there waiting, he got to walk around the shop with a little guided tour. And he found this sitting on a work amp bench. And he asked about the color. And they said, well, we're not really selling that guitar yet. It's something kind of new. He just worked them and convinced them. And he went home with two guitars that day. We have the receipt. It's pretty cool. So this is a January 51 guitar. So it's, it's a really early guitar, a really great example of a real nice original sunburst guitar. How does the Esquire fit into that history? Because, I mean, obviously it's the Tele-looking right. body, but it's before the Tele existed. Yeah, Leo experimented with several different guitar bodies, and he started with guitars made of pine. He eventually settled on ash as a good hardwood, tone wood, and we have that guitar also. The Esquire was, was a very simple design. It's basically taking a Hawaiian guitar and turning it into a Spanish guitar, standing it up so you could play it, you know, the way you're sitting right now. And it featured the idea of having all that output from that pickup just direct wire to a volume pot and a tone pot. And if you put that in the bridge position, really what you're getting is a pickup straight to the jack. And that's where all the output is. That's why right. a lot of guys really love Esquires. You turn that back and that's just, that's it. The thing that blows me away is that Leo's original designs from late 1949 and 1950 uh, are still in play today. Right. You know, you can buy a guitar like this virtually unchanged. I mean, it still feels like that familiar Telecaster. Yeah, and they're supposed to be body. like that old that old denim or that, that really broken in pair of gloves. Yeah, yeah. And, and that, that's what I love about these guitars. They, they feel sweet and they feel right the very first time you pick them up. The thing you're holding there, once again, another just crazy thing. We talked about it a little bit, but this is an all rosewood neck on this strap? Yeah, this guitar um, was made specifically for an artist named Eddie Cletro. He was a Fender and Dorsey, and he had a, uh, a couple of hits back in the 50s. And one of the interesting things about, well, there's a few interesting things, but one of them is this is the only guitar that was made until 1968 when they came out with the rosewood Telecaster. This is the only guitar that had a solid rosewood neck. The fingerboard is rosewood, but also the back of the neck, if you guys can catch that. The whole thing is rosewood. A couple of other interesting things. It's a custom color and it's a primer color called Desert Sand. And the reason why it's this color is it shows off really nice on black and white TV against a black 
tuxedo. Now, interestingly enough, it has an anodized gold pick guard, and that was something that um, Fender experimented with from like 1950 uh, six to 1959, and they originally were trying to somehow come up with a shielding idea for the 60 cycle hum, which you know is very annoying when you play a Fender guitar. Of course, yeah. Eventually came the humbucker and solved that problem for many, but not for Fender players. But right. this this was supposed to help shield. It really didn't huh. work out, but they had made so many of them that there was a no cost option until 1959. So gotcha. uh, this was the year here, 57 is the year for that real hard V in the neck that so many players covet. Yes. Another thing that I was curious about, how you were able to get all these amazing guitars. Actually, it started off with an eBay transaction, believe it or not. Back in the days of Beanie Babies only on eBay, <laughs> I decided to put up a 1954 Stratocaster, received no hits, no inquiries, nothing, uh -huh. until two minutes left in the auction and, and somebody buys it. Uh... And I think it was $25,000, if wow. I remember. And that, on an eBay transaction, was giant. A couple of hours goes by, and I get a call from a young lady. She says, I'm the assistant for so-and-so, and I want to buy that guitar, and here's my MasterCard. And I'm thinking to myself, who puts $25,000 on a MasterCard? You know? Right. I get a call from a guy a couple of days later. Hey, I just got this Stratocaster. It's an amazing guitar. I want to I want to talk to you about more guitars. That was almost 22 years ago. And now we're at like 2,300 guitars. There's so many guitars here. We should definitely get a couple more going, don't you think? Yeah. Can we check out some more? Absolutely, right. let's do that. Cool. David, a guitar has magically appeared in your lap. <laughs> <laughs> what, what do we got now? This thing, I know every one we're gonna pick out is just like jewel worthy. So what is this one? Uh, this is a, a kind of a freaky guitar. Uh, this was the guitar, one of the guitars that Fender brought to Chicago for the NAMM show in 1957. It is a Fender Telecaster painted in a custom color. And pre-1960, custom colors were really only ordered for celebrities or people that knew Leo Fender or one of the Fender executives or guitars that went to trade shows. So this color was called San Marino Blue. It's a 53 Buick color. Keep in mind that Fender used automotive paints and they used Duco, DuPont, nitrocellulose lacquer. What's interesting about this guitar and what makes it special is, well, first of all, it's got this Bigsby mounted on it, which changes the neck angle so they would have to put a shim in the neck and Bigsby would actually, the kit would come with a shim, a giant shim to change the neck angle. The coolest thing is you never see Telecasters with matching headstocks. But one of the freakiest things that I've ever seen on a guitar is the back of the body and the back of the neck, I should say, is San Marino blue. And that is something you never see. I only have one other guitar, and it happens to be a Telecaster mm -hmm. with a painted neck back. They're incredibly scarce. Although it is not my favorite sounding Fender uh -huh. instrument, yeah, yeah, yeah. I can tell you it, it's, it's really cool. And believe it or not, with a Bigsby, it's still pretty light. And so how did you guys acquire this one? This guitar came out of a collection that I had been following along the Canadian border. And the guy who had this guitar, I probably bought about 150 guitars from him over two days. When I opened the case, I honestly couldn't, I had to tell you, I couldn't believe my eyes. We were able to come up with pictures of this guitar at this, on display back in at the 57 NAMM show. We're really big on trying to keep documents on a lot of these guitars if we can find them. Can we hear like a, just a chord on it? I yeah, know, sure, uh, sure, no that. problem. You know, next has got that huge filter cap, all right? In the bridge position, you'll get a little bit more of the tone control. And, but I always love this position. I just love that. I mean, I don't have a whole lot of volume on this or gain, but you can get the idea of the differences in the sounds of the pickups in using the capacitor. Since we've got that big speed, can you hit a chord and give us a little shimmy Yeah, shimmy? yeah, we can definitely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you get that little rockabilly tone that I think that they were looking for. This is an absolute thrill so far. Something that I got to experience that, that we haven't talked about yet is the layout as a, as a patron of this museum. Can you walk us through that? Sure. The main room, which is up front, which is included with a $15.95 purchase price, gives you an unguided or a self-guided tour of a timeline that walks you through the 1950s, through the 1960s, and up to, to the beginning of the 70s. And it also gives you lots of other breakout exhibits of British Invasion. Gretsch area gives you a jazz area. It gives you a bluegrass area. Well, the glass enclosures, are right. those 
windows humidified inside? Yes, the, every, everything here is climate controlled. All the glass that you see around us and all the glass in the museum is 98% UV protected, as well as all the lamps in the, in the building and in the case. So we don't want to alter the finishes on any of these guitars. So as we move in through the museum, we're like basically in the back of the museum right now. Yeah, we actually have two theaters. We have live shows here that are very personal and intimate. A lot of the cases that you see are designed to go out of the way and open up clearer space that holds about 220 guests. So we've had this whole display in the main room, then we've got a performance stage, and then you keep going and we end up in this room. And behind me, we have the vault. So talk about this room, and then maybe we can talk about that vault. You know, it was interesting when we were designing this place, I had wanted to call this the green room. We figured this would be the main exhibit area that we would change out every 90 days or so. We didn't want people to expect or know what was coming next. So I decided to call this place the green room. The surf exhibit that's in here now will leave in mid-August and be replaced by an exhibit called Six String Queens, which is gonna be all about women guitar awesome. players through history, from Elizabeth Cotton, to Cheryl Crow and everything in between. Awesome. And uh, we're really looking forward to that and we're all in the design phase now and we'll be putting it up soon. <laughs> The vault. Yeah, <laughs> the vault. We thought it would be really cool to take about 90 of our rarest instruments, and not just our rarest instruments, but some of the rarest electric guitars that were. Bar And we decided to place them in a special room that was going to not be that accessible. We figured we would make it part of the extended tour, which takes you to the green room and the vault. So we built this place, which is behind us, where you see all the really nice, pretty glass. Well, that's all nice ballistic glass. And uh, <laughs> let me tell you, that's where you want to go when the world's ending. You want to run in that room because you want to play the guitar. <laughs> but, yeah. but it's 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 a really wonderful place, and it, it's also a place where our uh, tour guides allow us to open up a case and actually take a guitar out and put it in your hands. If you look like a knowledgeable guitar guy, you might wind up playing a burst that day or a flying V you know, from 58 or 59. Right. And it's something that very few people get to do. And we want to give people that experience. Yes. All right, we got another uh, one of a kind here, I think. This is the actual prototype for Leo Fender's Broadcaster guitar. Wow. It wears the serial number 0009. We suspect it was the sixth made. They would make many serial number plates in advance. You may have heard the story. They put them in a hopper, and as people manufacture guitars, they simply grabbed the closest one to the top. So serial numbers are really quite all over the place with Fender guitars in yeah. the early years. This guitar is very, very early and it originally belonged to a gentleman named Arliss McMinn. It was given to him to play by Leo Fender. Originally the guitar was a, it was a blonde color like you see most Telecasters. It has a lap steel pickup because they didn't have a neck pickup yet. And this neck has no truss rod. Well, Leo originally thought that the neck would be strong enough because it was rock maple. Well, they found that after a while that they did, but this neck is perfectly straight. Even the decal is prehistoric and the body is made of pine instead of ash. It is sandwiched, put together. There's a seam in here, if you can see that runs along the whole body of the guitar. So it's a pancake body. And the reason why is because it was cheaper when they were building prototypes to just buy thinner pieces of lumber and just get the basic shape. Like, think like a clay model at General yeah. Motors or Ford. So it was still a little experimental. Oh yeah, yeah. They, they weren't done yet. The story goes that this guitar was left behind that Fender for a long period of time until the gentleman who used to do the tweed covering on the amplifiers, Sam Hutton, discovers it there and asks about it. He's given the guitar. The guitar is given then to his son, Bart. From Bart, it goes to a, a, a pretty well-known guitar dealer and from that well-known guitar dealer to me. It is incredibly light. I want you to actually feel that. Wow. Okay, you're talking about a three and a half pound guitar. Okay, wow. again, not made for production. So it's a pretty unique piece. Actually, it sounds really good. It has very, very, very old strings on it. Most likely original strings. And the problem is, is that I don't want to be the guy who's going to break one of those strings yeah. off. Uh, so, it's not going to be me. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. So, so that's kind of our feeling on it. This is the original right yeah, here. That's, yeah, this is the, the, the two pickup model. 
Wow. And soon we're going to talk about the original one pickup model. That's the next one you're going to show yeah, me? Yeah, that's the next one. All right, let's check it out. What are we dealing with now? <laughs> In 1950, Leo Fender photographed this actual guitar to be used to introduce the world to the Spanish solid body guitar. Wow. <laughs> so this is actually the guitar that was used in the ad in 1950. This is the first guitar that was made by Leo Fender that's an ash body instead of a pine body, and it has that center seam. It's still sandwiched, because again, you could save some money that way, buying smaller planks of wood. Yeah. But essentially, this is the guitar that went public. They settled on the blonde color, but this is it. Now, we talked about the other guitar being serial number nine. This guitar is serial number 75, but was made before. Look at your guitar, it has a three-way switch there, right? Well, they hadn't yet really thought about that. They had a lamp button here uh -huh. that you could press and go high tone, low tone. Ah. The control cavity is sh shorter than yours. And also, where your pickguard is made out of white Bakelite material, this is made out of fiberglass. This one has the original flat wound strings on it. The guitar weighs an absolute ton. Remember how the pine one weighed yeah. nothing? Now feel the weight of this one. Oh! <laughs> that was a joke. I know, you got me pretty good. Um, Much heavier. Yeah, very, very heavy guitar. And believe it or not, by the time it went to production, it was a bit lighter. You'll also notice on the back, they weren't really yet sure how they were gonna put the strap button. Ah. So there is one in the back of the neck and there is one in the body. I know if it had a great set of strings on it, it would be one of the best sounding guitars. The neck shape on this guitar is unmatched. I, I don't think I own another Fender guitar that has the beautiful shape. The neck shape varies greatly, but in this guitar, this one just has the, one of the nicest feeling. So I love this guitar, and I, I think that this is one of the most prominent historical instruments that Fender ever made. Wow. I'm trying to remember this, and I know you, uh, you're you gonna know. So we had the Esquire broadcaster, mm -hmm. but then there was like a legal issue with the name broadcaster because yeah, of a yeah. drum set? Well, yeah, exactly. Well, Gretsch, who made guitars also, they had a broadcaster drum kit that was actually, the broadcaster was spelled with a K, where the guitar was spelled with a C. Fred Gretsch sent over a nice little telegram. We have a copy of it up front. Okay. And basically said, uh, don't do that. <laughs> and it was pretty nice, but yeah. it was to the point. Yep. And Leo immediately went to his uh, to his people and said, "Listen, take the decal and snip off the word broadcaster, and we'll think of a new name." You got to realize the broadcaster was named the broadcaster because of radio radio broadcasting. broadcasting. Yeah. Right? Okay. What happened? Television. Well, television. What a great idea. <laughs> we'll call it the telecaster. Well, the thing is amazing. We're obviously not gonna play it because the original strings. Right. Neither of us want to be that. I don't want to break that Yeah, string. we don't want to be that guy today. Right. So we do have another Fender that, that we're gonna dig into and then we're gonna, you know, be able to play it a little bit. Oh, absolutely. The next one, right? Absolutely. All right, let's check it out. We got another one here. What, what's going on with this one? <laughs> <laughs> what you're looking at is the 1952 Fender Nam guitar. Nam and, guitar? Yeah, North American Musician Merchant Show. What Fender did this year, and it was always a secret, top secret, what they were gonna do, and all the manufacturers. So they came out with these two guitars, and it was a copper Esquire and a copper Telecaster. The Esquire survived with its original color and it's one of a kind. The Telecaster, unfortunately, was stripped of its original finish. This guitar, thank goodness, was, was preserved in its original state. It happens to be one of the best playing and best sounding guitars. Again, one of those great neck shapes that we talked about before. An unbelievable, fulfilling pickup. Now remember, these are one pick up guitars, so you have to cover a lot of voicing and a lot of tonal range. And what's great about this particular one is that you get those really good deep basses and that woody mid-tone, and you also get that cat scratching on glass treble sound that you're looking for. Right, right, right. You wanna play some, uh, some progression or something on it? Yeah. We'll do a little jam. Telly, I gotta go.
right, David, thank you again for spending time with us here. It's, it's been a thrill. Uh, I'm sure you're very proud of what you've done. Proud and humbled. It's always an incredible thing when people come up and kind of, people like yourself that actually get it, who yeah. can validate what we've done, what I've done. Those are the moments I'm proudest of. You know? Nice, well, you've, you've done it. We got Songbirds Museum. Is there a website name that, that yeah, people can go to? Yeah, it's www.songbirdsguitars.com or nice. songbirdsrocks.com. Uh, you know, we, you can follow us on Facebook, on Instagram. Remember, we have a lot of great live shows here too. So check our show's yeah. calendar because you're gonna miss something pretty amazing. There's always something great going on here. The exhibits change often. We'd love to have everybody come in. I mean, honestly, for the price of a basic lunch, you can get admission to an amazing place. Nice. So we'd it love to awesome. see you here.